Order, order. The Science, Innovation and Technology Committee is in session, uh, and today we have a one-off session uh, looking at harnessing the power of fungi. Perhaps I could start with a question to Dr. Sheldrake. Um, uh, this is a, a, a committee that is very interested and, uh, in many cases, passionate about science uh, and uh, technology, but we're not experts, um, and probably a lot of the people tuning in aren't experts. So take us back to, uh, to Fungi 101 and tell us, um, give us an overview of fungi uh, and tell us how they differ from plants and animals. And perhaps in doing so, is it true, as we've read, that fungi are actually closer to animals than plants uh, in evolutionary terms? Well, thank you, and thank you for um, calling this session. It feels like a very um, appropriate time to be having this conversation. Um, so fungi are a kingdom of life, which is as broad a category as animals or plants, but they're a kingdom of life which have not had a kingdom's worth of attention. Um, when we think of fungi, we normally think of mushrooms, but mushrooms are just the reproductive structures of fungi. And most fungi live most of their lives not as mushrooms, but as branching, fusing networks of tubular cells called mycelial networks. And some fungi live as yeasts, as single-celled organisms. And uh, they differ from animals and plants. Plants um, harvest energy from light and from carbon dioxide in the air, uh, and produce their own um, energy-containing carbon compounds like sugars and fats. Uh, animals tend to find food um, to, to move around in the world and find food and put it inside their bodies. Fungi do things differently. They put their bodies inside their food using these branching, fusing mycelial networks. Um, so um, they have a different way of life to animals and a different way of life to plants, although they are, um, as you say, more closely related to animals than plants. What we mean by that is that the last common ancestor that animals and fungi share um, uh, lived more recently than the last common ancestor shared between plants and animals and fungi. Um, and fungi play vital and important roles in the biosphere. Uh, they are a kind of living seam that holds um, much of life together. They form symbiotic relationships without which no plants could exist. They help regulate the composition of the atmosphere. They make soil. Um, they eat um, rock and play vital roles in uh, circulating nutrients around, um, around the planet. So uh, they're really very key players uh, in, the, in the long history of life. Um, but they live most of their life out of sight, out of the reach of human senses. And so uh, it's difficult for us to notice what they do and to pay attention to them. Um, Dr Sheldrake, you've already touched on um, fungi's role in the biosphere. Could you broaden your response to that and state what ecological functions fungi perform within ecosystems? Yes. Um, so fungi are decomposing organisms uh, because of their chemical ingenuity and their ability to immerse themselves in whatever they're eating. Um, they are uh, vital in decomposing wood and dead organic matter and cycling those nutrients back around um, the ecosystems in which they live. They play vital roles in um, supporting the life of plants. Whenever you see a plant, you're looking at the outgrowth of fungal relationships, some of which occur in and around their roots, known as mycorrhizal fungi or root fungi, and some live in their leaves and in their shoots. Plant life would not be possible without fungal life, uh, and there are many ways they've found to associate. Um, and um, fungi play vital roles in <coughs> creating a soil habitat. They make soil. They hold soil together. Um, they form a sticky living seam that holds soil together. Um, so these are three. There are many, many I could go on, but I'll, I'll keep it short. Thanks. And um, we've heard about corn, obviously, um, but what role do fungi play within the economy and which everyday products utilise fungi or their derivatives? Um, well, fungi play such, um, such key roles in, in the whole biosphere and underwrite the regenerative capacity of the biosphere. So it's, um, that this would be a long list, but I would start with um, foods. So we have cheese coffee, chocolate, um, yogurts, many other fermented foods, soy sauce, miso, um, and drugs. Um, uh, another example, we have alcohol, we have cholesterol-lowering statins, we have immunosuppressants, uh, we have psychedelics like psilocybin, um, 
and a host of antiviral and anti-cancer compounds um, and many others. Um, any time we cultivate a plant, we're cultivating fungi too. So any part of the economy that depends on plants depends on fungi. So I'm thinking of agriculture and forestry. Um, Dr. Sheldrake, in your introduction, you said you talked about you know, being a kingdom, but you said that there hadn't been a kingdom's worth of research. Um, so I'm really interested um, in what the knowledge gaps are. How much do we know? Um, where are the gaps? And what role do you think the government should pay in terms of trying to fill these research gaps? Mm -hmm. So um, the answer is that there are a huge number of knowledge gaps, so, uh, many of which we don't know, unknown unknowns. Um, fungi were only <coughs> identified as their own kingdom of life in the late 60s when they won their taxonomic independence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not fully. <laughs> Not fully. <laughs> what this means is that um, there aren't nearly so many opportunities to study fungi as there are animals and plants. Um, so there's a lot of basic research that in the world of animals and plants has been done many decades ago that has still not been done for fungi. Um, there's also a lot of applied research um, that has not been done for fungi. So there are areas um, to do with fungal conservation, fungal taxonomy, um, things like decomposition, which is sort of as an unglamorous subject but is vital um, for many of the potential applications of fungi, uh, for example, in net zero and in um, bioremediation. Um, these are just some examples. And um, the UK government can play a much stronger role in supporting fungal research um, in uh, two main ways. Um, firstly, by not <coughs> funding mycological research. The UK is a centre of excellence for fungal research and expertise. There's institutional uh, and amateur networks um, of fungal enthusiasts. And um, so first it would be to not defund this if the opportunities to do so arise. Number two would be to involve the UKRI and to um, conduct a, uh, a review of the places where fungi are being funded by UK research councils <clears throat> and to identify places where the balance can be um, the addressed between fungi and animals and plants. And that might look like, firstly, including fungi where they're not mentioned in grant uh, frameworks, um, to issuing special um, fungal research programs, calls for funding for, uh, calls for applications for fungal research programs to help address the historic imbalance. And number three would be to make sure that on grant awarding committees there are um, people with some fungal expertise. In terms of conservation, and it's an important subject matter, how are fungi faring and what notable challenges uh, or pressures are they facing? Uh, fungi face um, lots of challenges. They face challenges from um, unsustainable agricultural practices like um, over ploughing, over application of chemical fertilisers, fungicides and pesticides, um, from habitat destruction like deforestation. Um, and um, but they're underrepresented in our litanies of preservation. Less than 0.2% of global conservation priorities are, are fungal. Um, this is a really big problem. Uh, there are a number of steps that can be taken to address this. Um, but the reasons why we need to address this are because when we sabotage uh, fungal communities and fungal habitats, we undermine our efforts to limit global heating, to stop the, um, the rapid loss of biodiversity. And, um, and also, we're destroying a library of ingenious fungal solutions that they've adapted, they've evolved over a billion years, um, many of which could be useful to humans in the future. So this bank of, uh, of fungal diversity that exists um, should be protected to, um, to help us move forwards in generative relationship with these organisms. Uh, for the benefit of the committee, for those that are watching, just explain why we should be sort of kind of more scientifically interested um, in mushrooms. Mushrooms are a uh, vital food for humans and have long been uh, a vital food for humans. Um, and um, there are many ways that we can um, work to include fun uh, mushrooms within our, our food systems. Fungi mushrooms can be grown on um, agricultural waste, like corn stalks. Um, they can be grown in a matter of weeks uh, inside without the need for large areas of agricultural land, um, apart from those areas of land needed to provide the agricultural waste. And, um, and are nutritious and 
um, have all sorts of interesting chemical properties and medicinal <coughs> properties that are in need of further research as well. Um, so this is an area of mushrooms have been used as medicines and as foods by human cultures around the world for uh, an unknowably long time. And, um, and this is a, a bank of cultural knowledge and wisdom that we are not fully uh, taking on board at this time. Um, so I want to turn to the subject of net zero, which you've touched on very briefly yourself already, uh, Dr. Sheldrake. Um, specifically, I want to think about how fungi could be used to perhaps help reach our ambitions for net zero. A very big question. Um, fungi touch so many aspects of the biosphere that, that one could talk at length about this. I'll choose um, the area that I research, a mycorrhizal fungi. Um, <clears throat> These fungi live in and around plant roots, and plants supply them with energy-containing carbon compounds like sugars and fats that they produce in photosynthesis. So these fungi are stationed at the entry point of carbon from the atmosphere into the soils, and the soils have a very important um, store of carbon, the, uh, the largest terrestrial store of carbon. Um, so. These mycorrhizal fungal communities um, play vital roles not only in, in getting carbon into the soil, but in stabilizing, once it get, stabilizing the carbon once it gets into the soil. Um, and, um, and we don't think enough about these underground ecosystems <clears throat> and these mycorrhizal communities that are playing such an important role um, in regulating the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Our work has shown that um, over 90% of mycorrhizal fungal hotspots on the planet are at immediate risk. They are not protected, um, simply because they haven't been considered. And um, so um, one of the ways that this could be addressed is by, first of all, um, not destroying these underground mycorrhizal communities, which play such vital roles uh, in getting carbon into the soil and keeping it there. Uh, and number two would be taking these fungal communities into account when doing um, restoration projects uh, and, and in researching different ways to research, um, to restore ecosystems as part of uh, nature-based solutions to, um, to global heating. You mentioned earlier the use of fungi in packaging. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about that application and also in construction if it extends that far? And what are the potential environmental advantages of using fungi in that way? And are there any limitations in its use at the moment? And how can they be overcome? I've just been working together with an architecture firm called PLP Architecture and doing a range of experiments on um, creating these different materials and testing them. Um, <clears throat> advantages include that you can use, again, agricultural waste, which would otherwise be a pain to get rid of, um, as the feedstock for these materials. Um, they can be decomposed rapidly after use. So in packaging, that's single-use packaging, that's obviously a, a big advantage. Um, they are um, quickly grown uh, inside um, in quite straightforward to make facilities. Um, so there are lots of things going for it. It's, um, it these materials tend not to be very durable, um, so they might not be uh, useful for high traffic areas where they're receiving a lot of contact, but for insulation, for uh, acoustic tiles, for packaging, this kind of thing, um, they uh, have a huge amount of potential. Um, it needs investment and research. I think with your expertise, there's probably some things that the general public can do to engage on their mycelial journey. There are definitely things that the public can do. In general, leaving dead wood lying around is a really good example. We tend to neaten up um, gardens, growing spaces, public parks and so forth. Um, dead wood is a vital habitat mm -hmm. for fungi. Um, uh, arboriculture is starting to change. Um, trees used to be managed as a public um, health question, and now it's much more about um, who is living in this tree um, and, and how important are they in the ecosystem at large. Um, so yeah, leaving dead wood around, um, that's a really good... Please to go, go. A, a very quick basic question about the balance between fundamental and applied research in uh, mycological sciences. Is the balance right currently? And if not, how should it be changed? Uh, Dr Merlin, to start, please. Um, so... There's actually just a new um, Centre for Applied Mycology at Cranfield, which is really good news. Um, I'd say, on the whole, um, applied mycology had had more investment because they are more promise of a return from that knowledge. Um, funky can be well established in industry, in fermentation, for example, and production of citric acid um, using Aspergillus fungi. Um, these are well woven into the fabric of long established industries. But um, what's your best fungi joke? <laughs> <laughs> um, <A> pun. 
Um, it's one that makes sense in Spanish. It's um, <laughs> oh, very good. What well, happened in Spanish? <laughs> Mi celio es tu celio. My cilium is your cilium. Uh.